Good morning YouTube. This week's video is a little late, sorry about that, but I am on vacation and so I'm doing what I feel like doing. So there. Today's Kingdom song was kind of a favorite in our house growing up and I'm not sure why, but it was. So this song underwent surprisingly few changes over the years, but there still were some and don't worry, you're going to get the full breakdown as usual. The song is entitled Myriads of Brothers, and it was number 64 in 1966, number 127 in 1984, number 122 in 2009, and it's number 99 in 2017. Now, there were no changes to the lyrics between 1966 and 1984. There were significant changes between 84 and 2009, but the song is still in the 2017 songbook with no changes from 2009. I also had a hard time finding a decent recording of this song. I usually prefer the piano accompaniment, but I can't play this song, and I refuse to spend any time whatsoever learning it. So the piano recording is not available on YouTube, but I found a few of the orchestral renditions and the newer recordings that they apparently use at the meetings now, as well as another super creepy version of the Bethel family singing this song in the 1960s. Now, the first verse in the orchestral recording is agonizingly slow. Myriads and myriads of brothers Stand at my side to be Each one a faithful witness Keeping integrity Oh my goodness, there is so much to unpack here. We aren't even halfway through the first verse. First off, a myriad is, in the classical sense, a unit of 10,000. In more contemporary use, a myriad is defined as a countless or extremely great number. Innumerable even. Now, as any single sister in a Jehovah's Witness congregation will tell you, there are not, in fact, myriads on myriads of brothers, if by that you mean infinite numbers of men. There are actually more women than men in the organization, so being a single sister kind of sucks. Now, let's talk about grammar for just a minute. The grammatical structure of this verse is really odd when you compare it with the melody, like you expect the first part to be a complete thought, but it isn't. So you have to look at it carefully to even understand what they're saying here. For years, I'd listen to this song and think, okay, to be what? Stand at my side to be what? Or is it my side that is, like, are they talking about standing at a side I don't have yet? Or, <laughs> I don't know. But then, on closer inspection, I think what they're saying is that the myriads of brothers are standing at my side as faithful witnesses, and the to be is just a throwaway couple of words that make the rhyme work. Which would be fine if it weren't confusing. Then we have keeping integrity to talk about. Now, I may have touched on this before, but this is a loaded phrase in Jehovah's Witness land. Integrity is defined as the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, or the state of being whole and undivided. Now, it sounds like a generally okay thing to strive for on the surface, doesn't it? I mean, integrity is a good thing to have. But what does it actually mean in Jehovah's Witness speak? To find that out, we have to go to the Watchtower of December 15, 2008 in an article called Why Keep Your Integrity? Because, you know, people all over the world must ponder this question every day. You know, Ethel, I just don't know if I should keep my integrity or not. It's just so high maintenance, you know? <laughs> anyway, here is how they define keeping integrity. <clears throat> and I quote, Here, then, is the essence of our integrity in the scriptural sense. Wholehearted devotion to one heavenly person, capitalized person, Jehovah God and his expressed will and purpose. Keeping integrity means that our day-to-day -day life, we, in our day-to-day -day life, we will seek above all to please Jehovah God. Our priorities in life will reflect his priorities. Okay, what's wrong with this? 
Well, how do the witnesses believe that Jehovah expresses his will and purpose? Bingo, the governing body through the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. So pleasing Jehovah God here means following the edicts of the society to the letter. Our priorities are his priorities, and his priorities are the governing body's priorities. This is a problem, people. Okay, in 2009, these lines were changed to myriads on myriads of brothers, millions for all to see, each one a faithful witness, firm in integrity. But if they're using the word myriads here to mean an infinite crowd, then why do they need to turn around and quantify it? I mean, they did fix the bizarre grammar, I know, but it's still not great. Myriads there are on myriads Truly a mighty crowd In all the nations of the earth They sing God's praise aloud Okay, so what's the big deal about there being so many of them? Newsflash, guys, a group can be dead wrong about something and still have myriads of followers. Just look at Adolf Hitler, or Donald Trump for that matter. As for singing God's praise aloud, as I recall, the singing at the Kingdom Hall was often lackluster, to say the least. Lots of people just moved their lips and expected the really zealous ones to carry the burden of actually singing this crap aloud. In 2009, these lines were changed to, Myriads we are on myriads, Growing a mighty crowd from every nation, tribe, and tongue, we praise our God aloud. Um, okay, first of all, I'm starting to get a feeling of argumentum ad populum, or the bandwagon fallacy. This is a common fallacy that assumes that something is true because lots of people believe it. Thus, if there's a mighty crowd who agree to something, that something is true, then that makes it true. But, there are plenty of idiots on this planet who believe ludicrous things, like the earth is flat, or certain people are superior because of the cards they drew in the genetic lottery. It just doesn't make them right, people. Secondly, in the new version of this verse, we need to talk about the word growing. Sure, there are 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses according to their numbers, but if you really dig into those numbers and do some valid statistical analysis, you'll see pretty quickly that they are not, in fact, growing, at least not like they did in their heyday. They're actually in decline. Their percentage of increase in average publishers is pretty much tanked, and now it's barely keeping up with birth and death rates. To quote the experts at JWFacts.com, this indicates that around 2 billion hours of preaching a year only brings enough new followers of Watchtower to replace the children that leave. So you can learn more about this in the link that I'm posting in the description to JWFacts.com. It's pretty awesome. Now, this next verse, I'm going to let you hear the Bethel family recording from 1966. Prepare to be creeped out. <laughs> You know, outside of a wedding ceremony, I've never actually seen a Jehovah's Witness brother clad in raiment white. I'm not sure most of them even know what raiment is. Stand in Jehovah's temple, serving in day and night. I'm wondering what kind of service Jehovah requires, particularly day and night. And why do they have to stand? There are plenty of unoccupied chairs in any given Kingdom Hall these days, especially during the day. In 2009, they did away with the white clothes in the standing and serving, and now it says, Myriads on myriads of brothers, we preach both far and near, good news of something better, which millions long to hear. Hmm. This reminds me of an old Sesame Street skit. Near. Far. Near. Far. And you know I have to ask, better than what? And why is good news of something better in quotes? Their so-called good news is actually 
really bad news for most of humanity, i.e. that merciful and loving creator Jehovah God is going to murder all of us for not joining a cult, apparently. Now, when this line is sung, also, it's really very awkward. Because of the way the melody works, the emphasis is on the word witch, which is kind of weird. And the idea that millions are just pining away, yearning and longing to hear about the Jehovah's Witnesses is just ludicrous. I mean, if that was actually the case, especially in this day and age, they wouldn't need to be out preaching at all or even sitting by their little carts. People would be seeking them out, which they weren't even doing 20 years ago when I was still a Jehovah's Witness. Most of them were slamming doors in our faces and telling us to get off their lawns. <laughs> remember ever telling anyone about owing salvation to Jehovah and his lamb, actually. I remember lots of, hello, my name is Bridget, and this is my friend whoever, and we're in your neighborhood today offering these magazines, The Watchtower and Awake. In this issue of The Watchtower, oh God, I have to stop, I'm going to puke. In 2009, they sort of re reused part of the 1966 songs, verse 3, to change the second part of this verse to... And as we keep on preaching, though at times we are stressed, Jesus refreshes the weary souls. He gives us peace and rest. Well, whatever are you stressed about, Jehovah's Witnesses? Countless hours of pointless busy work, preaching to people who have absolutely no interest in what you have to say, and the only ones who do are usually mentally ill or so traumatized that they need a cult to function. The fact that generations of subpar education results in poverty wages, that coupled with the fact that you must spend a number of hours preaching means that you're always poor and exhausted. Or the fact that you have to shun your friends and family if they step out of line, or even if they don't and a particular elder doesn't like them. Or even you. The fact that you can't receive or give the kind of unconditional love and acceptance that humans desperately need. Yeah, I was stressed as a Jehovah's Witness too. In fact, stress might be the understatement of the decade. I was so stressed that I had migraines that made me see things and panic attacks that even reached a point where I no longer wanted to live. And you know what? Jesus never refreshed my weary soul and there was not a moment of peace or rest until I left that cult far behind me. So yeah, this is crap. Now, back to the orchestral recording which is much faster in this verse. Myriads and myriads of brothers, they preach but fail and near. Far. God's everlasting good news, letting all people hear. Um, they do know that people is already plural, right? Right? And as they keep on preaching, though sometimes they're oppressed, close to the pastures, who leads them where they find peace and rest. Oh, come on, Jehovah's Witnesses. You might be depressed, but you're not oppressed. At least not in the U.S. And did you notice how they use the third person here? Because theoretically, they're talking about themselves, aren't they? Aren't myriads and myriads of brothers who are incessantly preaching Jehovah's Witnesses? Then why didn't they say we? Well, apparently somebody noticed that in Bethel because they changed it in 2009. To myriads on myriads of brothers, God keeps us in his sight. But then, if he were omnipotent, it would be hard to be out of his sight, wouldn't it? Safe in his earthly courtyards. What? What? Okay, look, y'all. A courtyard implies a building surrounding it. So, if earth is a courtyard, where is the building and what is it sitting on? Or does this mean that all courtyards on earth belong to the Jehovah? That would be awkward. Anyway, serving him day and night. Another recycled line. Myriads we are on myriads. With kingdom news we go. Well, where's the kingdom news going anyway? And why are we following it and not the other way around? Anyway, 
God's fellow workers, we have become serving him here below. Fellow workers? Really? This is ridiculous. Have you ever worked with someone utterly incompetent? Do you know what that's like? I mean, someone who can't seem to think their way out of a wet paper bag. Now, imagine if God were a thing, for real, and what it would be like for him to have to work a shift with one of us. I mean, just imagine trying to sort laundry or load the dishwasher with a four-year-old and you've just about got it. Also, here's an interesting idea. This line actually elevates the average Jehovah's Witness to the same level as God Almighty. Now, even to this atheist, that seems a little jacked up. I mean, if they actually believe that their God is the only true, almighty, all-knowing, benevolent creator of the universe, and that now they are his fellows? Wow, that's an ego trip right there. And on that note, I'll leave you with a question that has been bothering me since the beginning of this song. Where the hell are all the sisters? If there are no sisters, then where the hell did all these brothers come from in the first place?